You're listening to the Foreign and International Medical Graduate Show, a podcast to inspire physicians in the process of immigration to the United States and access to graduate medical education. We create meaningful and helpful content that motivates medical students and doctors throughout the world with the goal of creating a community that supports itself and gives feedback to each other, that stays updated with the most recent tips and advice on how to make it in America and become a successful resident or fellow in the speciality of your dreams. Dr. Alonso Osorio is board certified and residency trained in both emergency and family medicine and will be bringing you 20 years of his personal experiences, struggles and motivation. We'll be chatting with people like you to talk about the lessons they've learned along their personal path, how to make an impact and how we can all benefit from it. Also, we'll analyze the current resources available and how to benefit from them. Thanks for joining us. Please enjoy the show. Hi, superstars. And here I am back trying to find some amazing and unique content for you all. I really appreciate what you did for me during the year 2020 with more than 22,000 subscribers and downloads. I'm extremely satisfied to announce that I'm reaching episode number 60 coming up uh, later after this recording. And as I am scratching my head and putting my head on the pillow, I try to look for interesting topics that I can uh, discuss in the show. And one of those specific topics that I did a struggle with was uh, medical recruiting and physician recruiting in the United States. So I invited Mr. Darren Grella. He's the vice president for clinical recruiting for more than 10 years, 10 years and six months to be precise, for my company, U.S. Acute Care Solutions, based out of Canton, Ohio. And Mr. Grella comes with a huge deal of experience in, in, in rec- not only in recruiting, but he's also an, an author, former business owner, former career coach, and, and professional uh, and, and personal athlete at the university level. So I'm extremely delighted to have him over. He agreed to come for a few minutes and have a chat with us to kind of give us some enlightenment on what it's like to just find a job in America. Well, thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Well, as I was kind of digging through this stuff, I'm going to tell you, first of all, I want to thank you for having helped me uh, going through my recruiting process and, and, and what it's been like of these 20 years in the United States. I'll tell you too, uh, Darren, there has been no job that I have not had the opportunity to find without a recruiter. And I've been really kind of cautious about how I manage my resume and how I put it up on the web. Uh, I know that, you know, there's so many things that uh, you need to be careful out there. So just tell us a little bit about more uh, what you do, what you have done and what was like to write your, your personal book and how this has helped you become the vice president of recruiting for such a large healthcare company in the United States. You know, thank you for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed working with professionals like yourself over the years. You know, this year marks two decades in in the industry of helping people with their careers. You know, it's interesting to look back sometimes and pause to think of the tens of thousands of resumes that I've looked at, the thousands of people that I've interviewed over the years. You know, you figure if you're talking to, you know, a couple 300 to 400 people a year, right? Times 20 years. It's just a lot of people that you get to get to interact with. And you see different trends. You see people's personalities and you see tendencies. Um, you know, if we back up 20 years, what really got me into this space was honestly an opportunity, right? I like people. I had a business degree and I was like, okay, what do you do with that? Right. When I first got into it, it was a matter of helping people struggle and uh, who, who are struggling to help them uh, progress in, in their life. Um, much like being a father, you know, uh, father of six children. And it's, it's crazy, it's wild, you know, but, but you see progress, you know, whether it's something simple in their, their football skills or, or their, uh, you know, or their uh, interaction with other people and other kids. It's, it's great to see that. So as a, uh, you know, professional career coach, as um, you know, recruiter at heart, and now helping lead uh, a big uh, um, national team in the United States, um, you get to see people progress in their careers, and that's extremely satisfying, right? You, there was an opportunity that I found back in the day working with um, you know Big Ten schools in the United States. You know, there's different, I guess you can call them conferences that they break up the colleges in. So one of those big conferences is the Big Ten. 
schools like Ohio State, Michigan, and Northwestern, and, and, and the likes. Um, within those, you know, I was invited to the business schools to help their business students transition from college into the professional workforce. And so part of that was actually educating them on how to interview. You'd be surprised. You know, it's such a nerving thing, right? You don't know what's going to be asked of you. You don't know why they're asking that question and what that actually means. You know, how should I answer it? How shouldn't I answer it? You know, through that training material, you had the opportunity to write uh, and publish a book called The 10 Key Interviewing Techniques, which is the very basic essence of how to interview, right? And, and how to be prepared and how to answer certain questions and the insight of certain questions. So that, that was um, you know, an excellent tool to, um, to help people. You know, I got into the consulting world where you're consulting you know, digital marketing companies, uh, digital marketing companies within America to hire executives. You know, one of the biggest opportunities with the company is talent, right? If you don't have the right talent, you, you can't grow as a company, right? So finding the right people. So that was always, I guess, the most important key to the success of a company. At least I'm biased. I, I think that's very important to have. I think it's fundamental. People. They'll tell Absolutely. you high, high right. And if you yeah. high right, I think it's, everything sets the success from now from there on, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, since you brought up interviewing and uh, having written a book on interviewing process, I do know that many of our listeners are going to find this rather exciting to listen to because right now, thousands of foreign medical grads and U.S. grads are going through their residency interviews and the process being virtual right now has been remarkable difficult. Remarkably difficult for, for them, for the interviewer, you know, the, the residency program directors. And obviously, uh, just to give you an example, my interviewing process for, for this new job that I'm moving into in Texas was also completely virtual and over the phone. And the way uh, I, I, I got attracted to the job is because I saw this great recruiter that Pretty much in my personal experience, whatever she puts the eye, puts the money, puts the good job, puts the good location, and usually she's working with great employers. And she's well known in the world of uh, uh, emergency medicine. Her name is Barbara Katz, that you're probably very, very well related with. Yes. Barbara comes to ASAP every year and gives a, 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 a conference on trends and salaries, et cetera. And, and, and she's the one that actually helped me find this job. So I'm, I'm Apologizing in advance for 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 leaving uh, U.S. Acute Care Solutions, but I, I guess uh, Texas is Texas, and, and Tyler, Texas, is my new destination. That's great. And um, you know, the family is happy about it. A little exciting, and but we're gonna take the leap and make the move. You know, very good. Very good. I do know Barb Katz. She's well respected in the space. In fact, you know, I help her with those surveys that she puts together. So. She pulls individuals like myself to to gather those trends, right? She, so he really does over the years have a good pulse on, on the environment. So, yeah. Darren, how are we dealing with this COVID uh, pandemic situation and, and and recruiting? I did know when I lost my job, suddenly they cut physicians' hours, and then suddenly there was like a pause in the status of hiring, and then suddenly there has been a little pickup in the market what, what has been the trend between 2020 and 2021 for you guys in emergency medicine and and for the other specialties that you work with recruiting physicians and APPs etc sure the ones that I've been exposed to I, I can speak deeply of um, so primarily within our company we focus on emergency medicine hospitalist medicine and critical care medicine, so staff in the ICUs. So if you look at that spectrum, believe it or not, emergency medicine, the volumes have dropped considerably um, with, within the U.S. Uh, because people were almost scared to go to the emergency departments because they thought that's where they were going to get COVID, right? And so you see a drop in volume, which really the, the companies did not need to hire as many professionals to staff their EDs. So where you may have needed 10 people to staff an ED, all of a sudden with drop volumes, now you can staff that with seven. So if you had uh, you know, a couple, two, three openings at your location that needed 10 people, all of a sudden you're well staffed today, right? Because now the volumes drop and you can manage that. What we've seen is almost a complete flip in the market. Um, in emergency medicine for decades, there's been such a shortage of healthcare professionals. You just did not have enough to go around. So you can go to any city in any state 
and, and almost um, you know, demand your job, right? Because you had you could have a, a half dozen offers if, if you wanted. Um, in today's market, it is now almost flip flopped where you have, you know, you're lucky if you get an offer. Really, so and this is going to be a short, short-lived thing. Volumes are going to return, opportunities are, are going to abound again, and the market will flip again, where it's more of a, you know less supply and higher demand. Where today, in the period of COVID, there's a higher uh, uh, demand or higher supply and less demand. Makes sense. Yeah. What it's like to be always recruiting in within such a large healthcare corporation and organization in the United States. Uh, how large is your team and how do you guys in a simple way go through so many people looking for jobs and trim the fat to end up with only the best of the best and or who you want to work with? That's such a, a great question. It, it's a gut feel. I don't know if, if that, if that rings a bell, but it's like as a recruiter, you get a pulse on people you get a sense of who they are and you can almost read their character pretty quickly. I know that sounds unique based on the questions that they ask, based on their listening skills, based on their interactions. You can tell if this person is unique. You look at their, their CV, their resume, and you can see like, okay, they've been involved in these types of volunteer opportunities or they, they've taken on these additional work responsibilities. And you can tell from seeing that, that this person is a step above their colleagues for example, right? So because you're talking to hundreds, if not thousands of people every year, you get a feel for who stands out, right? It's kind of that gut feel. So in, in, our, in our world, we have a slogan, always be recruiting, right? So, so for our team, we have just under 20 people that support US Acute Care, which is um, just what we say over 220 hospital locations in 18 different states. So we're across the uh, US from uh, West Coast through East Coast and uh, and down through the South as well. So with that, you know, we are always building relationships. We don't believe that we're in a job filling business, but we believe we're in a relationship building business. So what the key advantage to that is is you're always able to interact with talent, whether they're looking for a job or not. You're building a, a relationship with that person, so they know. That when they do need to look for a job, you can be a person that could be trusted with their career. So, so that's our approach to it is that, yes, it is a difficult time. We don't have a lot of jobs to fill because the demand has decreased, right? But we do have a lot of relationships to build. We still talk with the same, if not more, people than normal in this year. And Darren, one thing that I have gotten to see over after 20 years of practicing emergency medicine in the United States or being here in the United States is that in general, this niche that we're involved in is rather small. Despite the fact that to people might appear rather large, the gossip about your performance, your professional demeanor, your reputation goes around. And if you do know that X, Y, and C providers slash physicians, doctors are performing well, you hear about it. And if they're not, you hear about it as well. And, yeah. and for me, it has been all about maintaining my name, keeping my name and my personal demeanor to a higher standard than average. Because, you know, if you screw up, everybody's going to hear about it. And right. I don't know if you agree with that whole situation of Absolutely. maintaining and keeping up with relationships across the country. Yeah, it's a very small industry. Right. It feels big, um, but it, but it is very small. You, you know, the thing that's changed in this job market is like recruitment incentives. You know, we talked briefly about this prior to this, this recording of the podcast, but you know, sign on bonuses, relocation bonuses where, you know, in a, in a high demand, low supply market, you know, companies needed to, it was an arms race, right? Companies needed to pay more money, needed to give big sign-up bonuses, needed to give big incentives to, to lure people in uh, a lot of times. And so in certain markets, our company would also do sign-up bonuses as well, you know, for that very reason. It's like you almost had to, it was the expectation. You know, we've seen those dwindle, if not completely go away, not just yeah. from us, but uh, many of our, our um, other colleagues out there in the marketplace, our competitors, it's just because they, they don't have to in today's world. You know, if they do, uh, they're dramatically decreased 
right? Um, you do always want to take care of the physician um, or the clinician in, in general through, you know, relocation expenses. That, that's not necessarily a bonus per se, but that's just doing right by the way of the individual. You know, the benefits and things haven't changed. You know, that's also something like if you have a lot of your listeners that may be looking for jobs and opportunities, just understand that we're in a unique time frame, and, um, you know, that's not something to be expected in, in today's market. The Foreign and International Medical Graduate Podcast is proudly sponsored by nextdaypodcast.com. As I said, nextdaypodcast.com. They provide podcasters like me with affordable podcast editing services with 24 hours turnarounds. You simply send them your raw recordings and they do the rest. If you're not podcasting right now at this moment, check out their amazing podcast launch packages. I'm one of those that is extremely satisfied. And if you use the promo code Medical Next Day, that's Medical Next Day, you will receive 10% of any of their services. Again, that's nextdaypodcast.com. So we can enlighten a little bit of our FMGs that have never dealt with recruiters. How, how knowledgeable in your experience are foreign doctors, not only doctors, but foreign doctors that you're getting exposed with uh, about using a physician recruiter? And what is the fear that some of them have or the misconceptions that they carry or that they have heard about or the fears, for example, sometimes on releasing their resume to a recruiting company? So I think many times there's this fear that, that they're inferior or less qualified as a clinician. I think that's a very real feeling, uh, which is completely false. Many times they're more dedicated, more educated, had to work harder for the same opportunity. And I, I love to see that as well, right? It's like, those are the people that really care more about their career and the opportunities ahead of them. It is what makes, honestly, America great is that People come in and can work hard for, for what they want, right? They have opportunities. You know, there's, there's, if you work hard enough for it, you can get there. So I think that's a real fear that, that people have. You know, language barrier is an issue for some companies and some, yes. some recruiters. You know, if you do have to deal with the immigration status, some companies do not accept that because it is a burden and a financial commitment on the behalf of the companies. So I've also found that, you know, as you mentioned, the, the, the industry is small. We're talking emergency medicine in this conversation, but the, the industry of emergency medicine is small. The industry of international FMGs you know, is, is even smaller. So when they know about an opportunity, there seems to be a lot of dialogue. We seem to get inbound you know, professionals coming to us and saying, hey, I, I heard you guys work with uh, J-1 visas. What, which locations do you have that, that I can work at, right? I think another misconception is I can go to the city of my choice and get the job I want. It's almost the opposite side, right? One is being feeling inferior. The other one is feeling like, hey, I can go wherever I want and get whatever job I want because, hey, I train just like everybody else. Very true. However, there are, um, there are rules and stipulations that we have to work through that you can only go to certain locations, right? So there are restrictions, governmental restrictions, for a lot of uh, FMGs and and um, how they fit. So the flexibility is a crucial skill or, or talent that, that they need to uh, believe in or incorporate in their day-to-day searching for a job is that you have to be flexible and understanding that this is an opportunity to get you in and, uh, and, and get you through that immigration status, right? Well, you have dealt over 20 years with so many people. And you said uh, after looking three, 400 resumes and talking to 500 people or more per year that are looking for a job, sure. what could you tell a foreign medical grad, not only for the process of finding a job in America after finishing the residency program, but for any sort of interviewing when coming to America to do their, their residency interview, what kind of tips of advice, basic things that you look at the eye at their eyes or look at their dress code or their demeanor that you say, this is the right person. He's saying the right words. What are the highlights that you, you are always looking for on the right type of personnel that you want to work with? 
another great question. Keep in mind, I'm I'm not a clinician, right? Absolutely, not, I understand. Not, um, so it's from my standpoint, I can't grade clinical skill set and clinical knowledge and bedside demeanor. But what I can do is get a feel for character and personality. And, and this transcends over the 20 years I've been, I've been doing this is, is that person. Everybody wants to work with people that they like. Correct. Right? So that personality. So when I meet you, you're bubbly. You, you have a, a you know, good interactive your communication, your smile. Like those are things that draw me in, right? That I know, wow, this is, this is a good guy. This is somebody that I want to want to interact with, right? So um, again, that comes back to confidence and it's difficult uh, sometimes coming to, you know, potentially to a new country. You don't know as many people. There's a little bit of a lack of confidence. It's like, wow, there's a lot of fears here. You know, be confident in who you are without being overconfident. <laughs> so if, if, if you can find that fine line, but personality stands out very far. Your ability to be engaged in the conversation, I would say, is another second point as far as asking good questions. You know, are you are you focused on yourself, meaning like, hey, what is my pay? Do I have any sign on bonuses? Can you tell me what my benefits are? Those are questions that would turn off a recruiter a little bit because they're thinking like, wow, this is someone that's focused on themselves and only what they can do. On the flip side, you have to understand when you're interviewing at a company, the company wants to hire you, right? They want to hire a good fit for their company. So they're not necessarily looking for the best individual, but the best individual who can play as a teammate, <laughs> who can be part of, of something bigger than an individual themselves. So keeping that in mind, that personality, that engagement, even a smile, you know, if you boil it down to something super simple, even that smile. And then, you know, asking good, engaging questions that lead more towards, you know, what can I do for you kind of thing versus what can you do for me? Makes so much sense. Darren, one personal experience that was overwhelming for me was going to the meeting of the National Organization of the uh, 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 Family Academy of Family Physicians when I was a family doctor or going to the meeting of the American College of Emergency Physicians and suddenly walking into the exhibits and seeing these huge signs of large companies that are looking for doctors sure. and coming across very well-dressed professionals like you, female or not, yeah. recruiters uh, that approach you, sometimes entice you through a little shirt or a little highlighter or a little pen or this or yeah. that to have a little conversation. And many doctors are fearful. How do you break, how do you make the doctor just walk in, feel relaxed, break that barrier? Because I know that many people kind of, are hesitant to talk, get information. They think they're going to say some, too much or not. I don't know. Tell us about what is that basic one-on-one -on -one relationship that you experience when these meetings are, are happening. That, that, is, that is intimidating. I can see it on people's faces having gone to years of these conferences, right? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I would try to avoid <laughs> that as your initial uh, meetings, right? So you go with a group of friends, or grow with a group of colleagues. So kind of go together. That might be helpful if you go in a group of people so that um, you can kind of have a little bit of, of a buffer, right? So you're not by yourself. You know, if you go to a national conference like that, um, you have a couple companies picked out that you want to go see. So you have a destination. So you walk there to that. Maybe even beforehand, you can make a point of contact and saying, you know, hey, Darren, um, I'm going to be at ASAP. You know, I saw your profile. Can you meet me uh, at the conference? Yeah, absolutely. Right? The, the companies want to connect with you and, and talk with you. So, you know, almost having that relationship ahead of time would be helpful. And that's specific for these big national conferences. Like you said, you walk in and there's huge booths and there's big bright lights. And yeah, it is intimidating. So, you know, just a, a suggestion might be to uh, make that opportunity smaller, meaning contact the company directly prior to, or just don't talk to anybody. <laughs> Gather information, right, on who you want to talk to, and then go back afterwards and, and then contact them, right? Makes sense. Yeah. Two things that I wanted to ask you, so we start wrapping it up, but uh, one of them is, first of all, you get the cold callers that call you offering you a job. Two, you get the emails that come from everywhere. On, uh, on regular basis, 
Three, you get the third party people that are sometimes smaller companies or companies that are making a commission of a commission of a commission. And I have seen some really bad recruiting firms out there. And then you have the real deal, the real people, large companies that have their own recruiting team like yours or people with great reputation like Barbara Katz that has her own company, uh, et cetera. Uh, how does a physician navigate this overwhelming amount of uh, messaging and people trying to offer you a job that sometimes they're not as good as the ones that you were expecting to find? Yeah. Boy, that's that's a that's a podcast in and of itself. <laughs> we can dive into that question for for a long time. I think a lot of it is uh, I get, to be simple: educating yourself on what you want, knowing what you want first, and then exploring that option fully. And if that doesn't work out, then go to Plan B, and then Plan C again. So, you know, for for medical grads, finding a company if you need if you need immigration help, right? Finding a company that can do that. So that tends to be your bigger companies, right? At first, a lot of those smaller one-offs or independent independent parties or locum agencies, locum tenums, you hear that. They don't have that capacity many times to help someone through that process. So um, that's something to help narrow it down. Understanding what kind of environment you want. Do you want to work as an independent contractor? Do you want to work as an employee do you want to have the opportunity to have ownership stake in, in, in a company? Like all those things, you have to figure out what's important to you. And then that'll help narrow down your markets. Um, you know, obviously, geographically uh, is another thing to help narrow that down. But you're right. It can be overwhelming. Come up with a short list of the top um, three to five companies possibly you want to work with or the three to five geographical regions you want to work within. And then focus your search on, on what's, what's available within. Your, your parameters. And one last question. What, what are the biggest challenges that you you see on physicians when looking for a job? But, well, let's say in emergency medicine, critical care and hospital hospitalist medicine. What are the biggest challenges that from our end we struggle on a regular basis when looking for a job and approaching a recruiter? You know, in a normal market, I would say the most challenging thing is narrowing down the right decision. In, in comparing... Apples to apples, you know, because and again, in a normal market, the supply is is low and the demand is high. So you can have multiple job offers that you have to weigh against each other. And you're like, wow, what really is important to me? Um, and I think many times you mentioned this earlier, at least alluded to it. You have different different things that are important to different companies. And you may have like you may be asking the wrong questions. And so you don't really know how to compare offer to offer a company to company. So I would say that's the most challenging part is, is uh, narrowing down the right decision. We found that um, it's an unfortunate stat, and this is a, a national stat, but uh, coming out of residency, that when, when the first two years out of residency, residents change jobs 65% of the time. Right. So they go through an extreme amount of stress in their, their final year of residency, finding a job. And then end up back on the job market, um, you know, two thirds of them end up back on the job market, primarily because they didn't make the right decision or they made the decision based on things that were important to them at that time. Um, and, and so that's that's the most difficult thing, finding the right thing that's going to fit. And, there, you know, there's nothing wrong with changing a job every couple of years. Right. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, companies want to see long term tenure and things so they have built in different tools to help retain people um, because it's so hard on a company standpoint to hire somebody that, that you want to keep them, right? It's easier to, to retain someone than it is to rehire someone, right? If that makes sense. So yeah, that's uh, I don't know if that helped fully answer your question. Right? Yes, it, but, um, it did. It's difficult. It's a difficult thing. And, and you said, obviously you said that you're a non-clinician, but how do you deal with the doctor's attitude in general, just for having the MD or the O behind their names? Sometimes I have, I can consider ourselves people that are extremely difficult to deal with because we think differently than many other professionals. And sometimes we're kind of clueless about benefits and compensations yeah. and money. Yeah. We're really good thinkers on medicine and the body, but when it's all about interacting sometimes with people or creating relationships or just talking about numbers, benefits, et cetera, we really, really, really suck sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And also money management for, for a, uh, a level professional that makes a, a great living. 
um, you know, physicians are notoriously bad savers, bad investors, um, just not good financially. So that's okay. You know, your lottery ticket is your ability to practice medicine, right? So that's, that's, that's the only thing you really need to focus on is taking care of patients, creating a great patient experience and being the best doctor you can be, right? Our job as non-clinicians is to support you in that. So it's to educate you on the benefits. It's to educate you on, maybe it is money management, right? It's to educate you on some of the business aspects um, b- behind um, things. We, you know, companies have training for those. Um, they have seminars. They have programs that can help educate. And also great people behind the scenes that can help a physician. So you know, your winning lottery ticket is your ability to practice medicine. And so that's the thing you, you look forward to protecting. That would be the biggest, uh, one of the biggest downfalls as well as um, doing something that's going to compromise your ability to see patients, right? So losing your license, for example, right? Those are the things that you need to be educated on, not just malpractice stuff. Malpractice, most people get into stuff, you know, in their career. It's just a, a, a numbers game. Typically, you know, it's, it's somebody will be uh, named in a lawsuit, yeah, multiple times through their career. You hope that never happens, but just by odds, sheer odds, it is, you know, what happens uh, in the United States. However, that's something that's oh, in, that you can overcome. That's something that, yes, you have to explain through um, every time you get credentialed, but it's not a big deal. It really isn't. Right. The, the big deal is your know, personal behaviors, um, things that are going to compromise your ability to practice medicine. So um, that's really all you need to focus on is is maintaining that and making right decisions there um, and taking care of your, your uh, lottery ticket. Life is all about decisions and perception. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Darren, if I, if I knew 20 years ago what I know now, <laughs> I can tell you things would be potentially a little bit more differently, uh, yeah, different sure. than what they are. Yeah. Well, uh, to round it up, I really want to take a minute to thank you your team, uh, Ed Ginley, your company, for having had welcomed me as a physician when I needed it the most, when I lost my job and suddenly I found myself finding a job rather quickly. Uh, I would say, obviously, I think I have a pretty clean resume and a pretty, pretty clean profile, but your company really extended uh, uh, everything rather quickly to make my transition as smoothly. And I have nothing but great things to say about U.S. Acute Care Solutions and, and just carry this message to your physician partners and, and everybody that has been involved. And and obviously, you never know when we're going to meet again, probably ASAP 2021. Yep. If it happens, yep. we never know where life is going to take us. But, um, you know, at the end of the road, um, uh, uh, you guys saved my career when I needed it the most. And now that I'm about to jump in a trip to a, a halfway across the United States to Texas, yep. Yep. you know, we're going to go and give it a shot. And I hope that it works out for me three times in my lifetime. I thought that I had found the job of my life and then I see myself starting all over, <laughs> but I guess that's part of, part of, part of life. And in emergency medicine, we've been blessed to be well compensated and still, and a specialty that I rather enjoy practicing. And I hope that I can do it for 20 more years if it got and, and life allows me to yes. do so. Yes, sure. Mr. Grella, I, I really appreciate your, your time, uh, taking a few minutes out of your busy family time with six children and a wife and, and not only dealing with us physicians on a regular basis. This has been amazing all over. I know that we could speak for hours and hours and create two, three, four podcasts, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a taste of what it's like to, to find a job in America to our physicians that are, are immigrating and are, are coming to the U.S. looking for a job and to interact with someone like you and your team. Thank you for your time. I appreciate everything. You bet. I, it's a pleasure. Thank you. It's been amazing. So, guys, having said that... Uh, Episode number 59 comes to a close and episode number 60 is going to be rather interesting. We're going to be talking about how the USMLE decided to shut down and close the clinical skills part of the testing. I don't know, probably maybe due to the pandemic, probably due to the fact that they're not collecting enough money. We won't find out until a few months from now. But having said that, we'll see you in the next episode. I know you're going to like it. Stay tuned and thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Grella. Gar-